Welcome to the HEC coach. If you are preparing for an oil and gas HEC interview, you are in the right place. Today, we are covering the top HEC questions hiring managers ask with detailed answers to help you crush your interview. Let's dive in. Question. What is the role of an HEC officer in the oil and gas industry? Answer. So, what exactly does an HSE officer do in oil and gas? Well, their main mission is to keep people safe and protect the environment. They are the ones making sure everyone goes home unharmed and operations don't harm the planet. Here's how they do it. First, they conduct risk assessments, hunting down hazards before they cause trouble. Think leaky pipes, faulty equipment or unsafe work practices. Next, they implement safety policies, turning rules into real-world actions. No shortcuts, no excuses. They also organize training and drills because knowing what to do in an emergency saves lives. Fire drills, spill response, you name it, they train for it. Then there's the daily grind, monitoring work sites, checking PPE compliance. Yes, that means hard hats, gloves and goggles are non-negotiable. When accidents happen, they investigate thoroughly, not to blame but to fix what went wrong, how do we stop it next time. And behind it all, Strict compliance with OSHA, EPA and other standards. Because in this industry, safety isn't just policy, it's the law. Question, what are the major hazards in the oil and gas industry? Answer, first up, fire and explosions. We're dealing with flammable gases and liquids here. One spark near a leak and boom, disaster. That's why hard work permits and gas detectors are absolutely critical. Then there's chemical exposure. Imagine invisible killers like hydrogen sulfide, H2S, just a few breaths, can be deadly. Or benzene, long-term exposure, cancer risk, proper respiratories and gas monitors, unoptional. They're lifesavers. Confined spaces, these are silent death traps. Oxygen drops, toxic gases build up. You could pass out before you even realize something's wrong. That's why we never enter without testing the air and having a standby rescue team. High pressure systems are another nightmare. Equipment fails, pipes burst, that's how blowouts happen. Regular inspections and pressure relief systems are the only thing standing between routine work and catastrophe. And don't overlook the simple stuff. Slips, strips and falls kill more workers than you think. Oil covered platforms, uneven surfaces, one wrong step and you're in the water. Non-slip boots and guardrails matter. Ergonomic hazards creep up on you too. Lifting heavy equipment wrong, your back's done. Repetitive motions, hello, lifelong pain. Proper techniques and equipment adjustments make all the difference. Finally, environmental pollution, oil spills, gas flaring. This isn't just about fines. It's about destroying ecosystems and communities. Containment plans and leak detection systems are just regulatory checkboxes. There are responsibility to the planet. Question, how do you conduct a risk assessment? Answer, first up, hazard identification. This is where we put on our detective hats. We're looking for anything that could cause harm, chemicals that might leak, machinery that could pinch or crush, even biological hazards in some cases. Walk the site, talk to workers, review equipment manuals, leave no stone unturned. Now we move to risk evaluation. For each hazard we found, we need to ask two crucial questions. How likely is this to happen? And if it does happen, how bad could it be? We're not just guessing here. We use data from past incidents, manufacturer specs, and worker experience. Time for control measures. This is where we put our safety plan into action. Remember the hierarchy? First choice is always elimination. Can we remove the hazard completely? If not, can we substitute with something safer? Then, engineering controls, guards, barriers, ventilation. After that, administrative controls like training and warning signs. And finally, PPE, our last line of defense. Don't forget documentation and review. This isn't just paperwork. We record every finding, every decision, because tomorrow's team needs to know why we made these safety choices. And we schedule regular reviews because conditions change. New equipment arrives, Processes get updated and our risk assessment needs to keep pace. Remember team, a good risk assessment isn't just a formality. It's what stands between your crew and disaster. Do it thoroughly, do it regularly and most importantly, take action on what you find. Question, what is a permit to work system? 
answer a permit to work isn't just paperwork it's your lifeline when dealing with high risk activities like hot work confined space entry or electrical work think of it as an official green light that says yes we've made this as safe as possible here's what a proper ptw system guarantees first all hazards are identified and controlled before work begins no surprises no we'll figure it out as we go every risk is accounted for up front second and this is crucial only trained authorized personnel perform the work no exceptions if you're not qualified and on the permit you don't touch it period third emergency procedures must be in place and understood by everyone involved because when seconds count you can't be searching for the emergency plan finally the ptw ensures crystal clear communication between all teams operations maintenance contractors everyone's literally on the same page about what's happening when and how remember in high risk environments your permit to work isn't bureaucracy it's what keeps your people alive never bypass it never take shortcuts and always respect the process question what is h2s and how do you protect workers from it answer imagine this you are on an oil rig and suddenly you smell rotten eggs that's hydrogen sulfide h2s but here's the terrifying part at high concentrations it stops smelling and just a few breaths can knock you out permanently hydrogen sulfide or h2s is a deadly gas found in oil and gas hobs it's flammable heavier than air and attacks your nervous system no warnings no second chances so how do we fight back here's your survival toolkit one gas detectors and alarms your first line of defense if it beeps move two ventilation in confined spaces stale air equals death force fresh air in 3 scba gear for emergencies this is your oxygen lifeline never enter an h2s zone without it 4 training drills because panic kills no evacuation routes buddy systems and never play hero h2s doesn't forgive mistakes protect your team detect ventilate equip and remember safety isn't just policy it's what keeps your crew alive question what is the difference between lel and uel answer LEL stands for lower explosive limit. This is the minimum concentration of gas in air needed to ignite. Below this level, the mixture is too lean to burn. UEL is the upper explosive limit. This is the maximum gas concentration where combustion can still occur. Above this, the mixture becomes too rich to ignite. And let's take methane, the main component of natural gas. Its LEL is 5%, meaning if there is less than 5% methane in the air, no explosion risk its uel is 15% above that concentration again no explosion between 5% and 15% methane in air that's the danger zone where ignition could cause an explosion this is why gas detectors are so critical they alert us when concentrations approach the lel giving us time to ventilate or evacuate before reaching explosive ranges remember these numbers vary by gas hydrogen propane gasoline vapors all have different explosive ranges always check the specific lel and uel for whatever substance you are working with question how do you ensure fire safety in an oil refinery answer one fire prevention first stop fires before they start control every possible ignition source that means strict hot work permits for welding or grinding enforce no smoking zones yet even that quick cigarette can ignite vapors and eliminate static electricity risks proper grounding is non negotiable to detection and alarm systems early warning saves lives smoke detectors <laughs> gas monitors they are first line of defense if there's a leak or a spark these systems scream danger before flames even appear and when they go off react immediately every second counts pre fire fighting equipment when fire strikes you need to fight back fast fire extinguishers placed everywhere inspected monthly sprinkler systems tested and ready to drown flames in seconds and for oil fires foam systems because water alone can make it worse know your tools train your team or pay the price for emergency drills panic kills That's why regular fire drills are mandatory. Practice evacuations until their muscle memory. Two minutes to reach assembly points. No exceptions. Because in a real fire, chaos means 
casualties. Fire safety isn't luck, it's layers of prevention, detection and readiness. Do it right and everyone goes home. Question, what is the difference between a flash point and auto ignition temperature? Answer, first flash point. Imagine you are heating diesel fuel. That magic temperature where it starts giving off just enough vapor to flash briefly when exposed to a spark or flame, that's its flash point. Key things to remember, it needs an ignition source and the fire won't sustain itself, just a quick flash and it's gone. Now, auto ignition temperature is completely different. This is when a material gets so hot, it spontaneously combusts. No spark, no flame needed. Picture an overheated engine component igniting oil that's dripped onto it. Scary stuff. Here's why this matters in the field. When storing flammables, you worry about flash point for safe handling. But for hard work or equipment design, auto ignition temperature becomes your critical safety parameter. Question. How do you manage contractor safety in oil and gas projects? Answer. First, pre-qualification. You wouldn't hire a driver without checking their license, right? Same logic applies. Before any contractor steps foot on site, we vet their safety records training certifications and past performance. No shortcuts, no exceptions. Next up, site-specific safety induction. Every oil rig, refinery or pipeline has its own dangers. Contractors get a crash course on exactly what they're facing. H2S zones, confined spaces, high voltage areas. Knowledge isn't just power here, it's prevention. Now, the golden rules, permit to work, PTW and job safety analysis, JSA. No hot work, no confined space entry, no high risk activity happens without these. They force us to stop, think and plan because winging it gets people killed. But paperwork isn't enough. We verify with surprise audits and inspections. Are guards in place, gas detectors working, PPE actually being worn, trust but always verify. And when things go wrong, full transparency, every near miss or incident gets reported, dissected and turned into a lesson. Blame games, zero tolerance. The goal, never repeat the same mistake twice. Question, how do you conduct an incident investigation? Answer, when an incident occurs, a proper investigation isn't just about paperwork, it's about preventing the next accident. Here's how we do it right. First, secure the scene immediately. This is priority number one. We make the area safe to prevent secondary incidents, preserve evidence and protect our team. Next, gather evidence like a crime scene investigator. We take time-stamped photos, collect equipment logs, and most importantly, interview witnesses while memories are fresh. Every detail matters. Now comes the detective work, root cause analysis. We use tools like the five whys to drill down past symptoms to the real causes. Was it equipment failure, training gaps, procedures not followed? The fishbone diagram helps visualize all contributing factors. With the why uncovered, we recommend corrective actions, not just quick fixes. We implement systemic solutions. Better training, equipment redesign, procedure updates, we target the root causes we identified. We then report findings to management with clear, actionable recommendations. No sugar coating, just facts, analysis and solutions. The real test. Implementing lessons learned, we update training programs, modify procedures and share findings across all sites because if one location had this incident, others might be at risk too. Remember, thorough investigations with regular follow-up audits are how we stop repeat incidents. This isn't about blame, it's about building a safer workplace for everyone. If you found this helpful, don't forget to like this video and subscribe to our channel for more safety tips, industry insights and career guidance. Stay safe and we'll see you in the next video.